Hello everybody, I'm Ken Raggio and this is a prophecy news break for April the 24th, 2023. Thank you for joining me tonight. My subject is only truth will make you free. And I'm talking about the gospel truth. I'm talking about truth in the church and truth in even the state of Israel. We're going to talk about some prophecy stuff, but a greater truth here is today that Jesus, as anybody should know, said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the truth, but it is imperative that you understand that it's not merely the embracing of Jesus Christ as a historical, true historical character, but it's an understanding that John told us in the first chapter of John. He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, he said, the Word was made flesh. So, when we say that we embrace Jesus Christ or that we believe in Jesus Christ, we're saying that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. Now, the Bible is about 1,200 pages of the Word of God. And so to say that Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh is to say that every single thing we see in this Bible is what Jesus is. Jesus Christ is the manifestation of everything God has ever said and the manifestation of everything that God has ever done. He is the image of the invisible God. And in one place, Jesus said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Uh, let me give you an example, uh, an example of prayer, for example. If you go to pray, prayer, you should understand, is more than just words. A lot of people go through ritualistic type prayers and they pray words that come from, for example, a prayer book. But we know that besides that, prayers come from the heart or they come from the head. For example, I pray every day and most of the time I have notes in front of me when I pray. I keep notes of all the people I want to pray for. I keep prayer lists of names and people and things that I want to be sure to pray about every single day. But there is something even greater and more intense than that and that is that prayer comes from altogether the end. There are several instances in the Bible when you see uh, where people like Abraham said in his heart a certain thing, or God even is said to have said in his heart. These are things that were never verbalized through the mouth. They were not said with lips and tongue. They were things that were said in the heart. And there's plenty of evidence for us to believe that we can pray without articulating words with our lips. A prayer can be inside your heart, but when you, you, you take that another step, you realize that when something comes from inside of you, who can say where the heart is? Now, we know what the physical heart is. It's an organ inside your chest that sometimes if it has problems, the doctors will open up your chest and try to repair your heart. But that's not the heart that your prayers come from. The heart of a man is a spiritual uh, inner workings. And I'm inclined to believe that your heart is in every living cell of your body. And so what I mean to say is that when I pray, I pray something that is ever much a part of me. When I begin to pray, I'm praying something that I feel way down deep in my soul, way down deep in everything that I am, from my head to my toe. I think that every fiber, every cell, every molecule in my body has a desire. For example, there are people that I know and love that are very dear to me. When I pray for them, it's not just head knowledge that makes me pray. It's not just uh, emotionalism. It's not just a, a family affinity or a friend affinity, but it's something that's deep in me. It's the, it's the complex... Uh, homogenization of everything I know about my friends and about, about God and about life and about eternity, about the Bible and the will of God and the gospel, all of these things work in me so that when I see someone I know and love, there's a desire in me that says, I don't want my loved one to be lost. I don't want my loved one to die and go to hell. I want them to be saved. I want them to be born again. I want them to live forever in the presence of Jesus Christ. And that permeates every fiber of my being and it's a it's a it's a craving it's a desire it's a it's an intense motivation that makes me want to seek God daily to to cause people to be saved there's 
There's just, it's a composite of everything that's in me that makes me pray. And I believe that you probably have experienced some things like this. Some of the desires that you have when you pray, they're so intense. They're so far uh, spread out in everything in you that you just can't stop praying and you can't stop desiring. And there's so much more to that subject of prayer than anybody can really uh, totally articulate. In fact, I wrote a book called Praying on Purpose, Praying for Results, How Men Prevail with God. And in that book, I spent uh, the better part of a couple of years writing that book, compiling everything I could get from the Bible. And I had written hundreds of lessons over the years uh, in my personal notes about prayer. And I compiled all those things. And then I compiled the sayings of so many people that I'd ever heard, so many books I'd ever read, some of the great people who had a history of prayer in their lives, who had so many great things to say about prayer. And I put all of this together into a book of many hundreds of pages. And yet when it's all said and done, it's only a drop in the bucket to everything that could be said about prayer. And so prayer is a vast subject. And the truths about prayer are vast. And the more you know about the truth of prayer, for example, I'm just in a little pocket, I'm just in a little uh, small area of this whole subject I'm talking about tonight. Truth makes you free. It's an evolutionary pro uh, progress. It is a progressive thing that happens. One truth is followed by another truth, is followed by another truth, and some of them work in sequence. Some of them set work in parallel. Some of them work in symbiosis. But truth after truth after truth gives you a greater and a deeper revelation of God and a more intimate experience with Him and a far more fruitful and productive relationship with God. But it's not just in prayer. It's in every subject of the Bible. You shall know the truth. Only truth. Now, juxtapose that to lies and deceptions and untruths. You can't get a lie out of a truth. You can't get truth out of a lie. They're two completely different things. Jesus spoke of the devil being the father of lies. And we know that people who follow after unclean spirits are people who entertain lying spirits. And so with that in mind, everything that we know about the gospel demands that we seek the truth. Only truth can make you free. It's true in the gospel. We've got a minimalistic Christianity today that only preaches the hand-picked, selected parts of the gospel that they want to hear. They'll, they'll preach the goodness of Jesus Christ. They'll preach the love of Jesus Christ. And all of these segments, all of these parts are valid and they are legitimate and they are important and they are necessary. But the problem with modern Christianity, and it's the same thing is true in Israel. There are so many things that so many people know about God, but what they know is not enough. It's not a comprehensive truth that they have. It's a partial truth. And I learned long ago, no part is as big as the whole. I mean, you've you got to learn that in geometry. Uh, an eighth of a pie is not the equivalent of a pie. You may get a little taste of a pie, but you haven't eaten a whole pie. And you may have a little taste of the gospel, but you don't have the whole gospel unless you get it down just like the Word says. And Jesus said you'll know the truth. F folks, let me tell you something. You need the truth about everything. You need, to, you need to know the truth about your attitude, about your mind, about your obedience. You need to understand the truth about what the Old Testament's all about, what the truths of the Old Testament, what are the commandments of God about, what are the purposes of the commandments, why are we required in the Old Testament to keep the commandments, and what does that have to do with the New Testament, and how do we apply everything in the Old Testament to the New Testament, and how, do we, how, do, how are we truly going to be saved? And I hear, and one of the reasons I'm saying this tonight is because I hear so many minimalistic sermons that have the sweetness of Jesus Christ to them. And, and I can't deny that the love of God is a great, vast subject. Paul said in the 13th chapter of Corinthians that there are three great virtues there. He said faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And so this virtue of love 
And a lot of people, that's, 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 they, they hammer on love, 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 love. And they preach on love. They preach on love. Sur Sunday after Sunday, service after service, sermon after service. They're talking about the sweetness of God and the goodness of God and the love of God. But folks, let me tell you something. There are other attributes about God that are juxtaposed to the love of God. And you have to understand that God not only loves, but God also hates. And you need a revelation of the truth about what God hates. When you read this Bible in its whole, you understand that God is also a God of vengeance. He is a jealous God. He is a God of wrath. He's coming back to execute people who have not done His will. And we are obliged by the Word of God. And there's, there is freedom. I hear so many people that don't want to hear this kind of talk. They don't want to hear strong doctrinal preaching. They don't want to hear strong holiness preaching. They don't want to be told that you can't do this and you can't do that. But it's in the Bible. There are certain things we must not do. There are certain things we cannot do. And only the truth will make you free. Now, folks that follow me know that I preach a lot about prophecy, and I can tell you something about Israel right now that's important for everybody to know. Israel is right now, here at the end of April, beginning to celebrate, and will celebrate all through the month of May, the 75th anniversary of the rebirth of the state of Israel. If you know anything about the history of Israel, you know that when Jesus was here, he prophesied that shortly after his departure that the holy temple of Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, and the city was going to be ransacked, and the people were going to be dispersed. And it happened in 70 A.D. The Romans came under the general Titus, who was the son of the Roman Caesar Vespasian. And they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They destroyed the Holy Temple. And they took the Jews into captivity and dispersed them around the world. And for almost 2,000 years, Israel had no home. They had no temple. They had no priest. And they were just a scattered, dispersed people. They called them the, dis the diaspora. But now in the end of days, we've seen how that the Bible says that, and I, and I take it from the book of Matthew, chapter 24. He said he was preaching all about the signs of the last days and about the coming of the Son of Man. He said in Matthew 24, 32, learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you shall see all those things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He guaranteed us, saying these words will never fail. That when you see these end time signs begin to take place, one generation is going to be all that's left. And when you take into consideration that in 1948, that fig tree effectively budded. We had many times at many occasions throughout the Old Testament when God referred to Israel in terms of fig trees and figs. Uh, good figs and naughty figs. He, t he, he cursed in the New Testament. Jesus cursed the fig tree, symbolic of his cursing an unfruitful people. The Phariseeism and the religion of the temple had failed to follow the Old Testament pattern, and he cursed it effectively. And, the, and, and so for that time, the fig tree died and became completely useless. But in the end of days, God has raised up the fig tree again, and the nation of Israel was reborn in 1948. And I'm still talking about the truth will make you free. There are truths in that reality that we need to hear today. The truth will make you free. We are now in the 70th, 75th year of the last generation. This is a huge truth. And there's freedom in this truth that's not being preached in most pulpits today. There's freedom in the realization that God has us on a timeline and we are at the end of that timeline. You have to realize these truths are freedom giving. They bring freedom to us. They make us free. You say, well, how do I know how long a generation is? Uh, the psalmist said, chapter 90, verse 10, the days of our years are threescore and ten years. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, 
Yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it's soon cut off, and we fly away. Let me tell you something. We are right now in the 75th year of the last generation. That prophecy in Psalms tells us that a generation runs typically 70 to 80 years. All you have to do is look at the world statistics to this day. All over the world and virtually every nation on earth, the mortuarial statistics say that people typically die in their 70s. It may range to the early 70s, to the late 70s or early 80s, depending on what part of the world you're in. But the fact remains that a generation is 70 to 80 years according to the word of the Lord. And that means that you and I are approaching the end of a generation. If you can count to five, then you can count how many years that we have left in that generation. We're in the 75th year of the last generation. Now, guys, when that truth gets into your spirit, when it gets into every cell of your body, when it gets into your mind and into your heart, you're going to realize that a whole lot of what's being preached in the world today is phony baloney. We've got people that are still got an empire-building attitude about what the church is out to do. I'm here to tell you we are living in the days when the church is about to go through great tribulation by the word of the Lord. Don't refute the word of the Lord. Jesus said, though in those last days then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. If you renounce that truth, it's not going to set you free. It's going to bind you. You're going to be bound by a lie that makes you believe things and preach things and live things that are not according to the word of God. It's a spiritual cancer to believe a lie. It's a deadly thing to embrace a lie. You cannot see the light when you put darkness in the way, when you bring deceptions and lies into the picture. How many times did Jesus say when they asked him to tell them about the signs of the end times? He said, be not deceived. Many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. You need to understand that the beauty of that man's sermon does not necessarily attest to the quality of his sermon. He can preach a beautiful sermon that makes you feel so good, but it is so doctrinally incorrect. It is deceptive. It's leading you into deception. We have one of the greatest periods of false hope in the world today, where preachers of every kind are preaching false hope to a people, preaching them things that are going to happen it's things that were addressed so many times in the scripture when God said in the days of men like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, woe to the prophets that prophesy a vain thing. Woe to the prophets that say, thus saith the Lord, and the Lord hath not said. We're living in that kind of a time when people want you to make, feel, make you feel good. They want you to feel saved when they won't preach a gospel to you that makes you change the way you're living. I want to tell you, this Bible said, tells you that without repentance, Penance, uh, Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We're not living in a day of so much grace that you don't have to repent anymore. We're not living in a day when God loves you so much that he won't send you to hell. It's always been true that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It's not different in the New Testament. If you sin in this day, you will go to hell. And we've got a lot of people that will insult you to your face if you try to preach hell, fire, and brimstone. But I'm going to tell you, hell, fire, and brimstone is still in this Bible. And it's, a blind, it's the obligation of every man of God to preach hell as hot as it is and to preach repentance to turn from your transgressions and get right with God so that you won't suffer the punishment of hell and for what it's worth God is the one that created hell for the devil and his angels don't tell me hell is not an important doctrine hell is one of the most important doctrines in this Bible and you better preach it you'd better believe it and you better live a kind of a life that will keep you out of it in Jesus name you'll know the truth and only the truth will make you free. We need the whole truth. No part of the truth is as big as the whole. If they preach two or three great doctrines every Sunday, they make you feel like they're doctrinal masters. They can make you think, well, he's got a doctorate degree in theology. That doesn't make any difference. The Bible said there's a group of people in the last days who are ever learning, 
ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We've got men that are brilliant. They have great IQs. They've got great expertise. They're powerful speakers, powerful uh, influencers, and yet their doctrine is incomplete. They're not preaching the truth and the whole truth. They're holding back on you. They want you to feel good without making you make that commitment. And I'm here to tell you, it is the obligation of the man of God according to the word of God to show my people their sins. If the preacher won't show you your sins, he's failing God and he's deceiving you. He's leading you in deception. He's giving you a false hope and you better run as hard and fast as you can from that man because he's not your friend. We're in the last generation. Jesus said when you see that man of sin standing in that temple commit an abomination and let them which be in Jerusalem flee to the mountains for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world of this time nor shall ever be. We have conflicts going on in the Middle East right now that are about to break into one of the worst wars the world's ever seen and the Bible calls it Armageddon. If you follow the news, whatever you read, the Jews and Post or the Times of Israel, any of the, any of the uh, journalistic reports of what's going on in Israel, Israel, I see it in headlines in more than one just different uh, news agency. They're saying Israel has never been in so much chaos. There's never been such a time of political upheaval in Israel where people are at one another's throats. They say this is a time of great weakness and vulnerability for the state of Israel. I'm telling you that's all by the word of the Lord because the Bible said in the last days there are going to be armies that are going to come and encompass Jerusalem. Jesus said when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, you know the desolation thereof is nigh. Now a lot of people don't want to hear a preacher talk about this kind of stuff. People don't want to hear this prophetic stuff. They want to believe the church is just going to go on and on and on and revival and revival and, and more spiritual incline and the bigger buildings and more money and bigger budgets and, and more uh, entertainment and bigger TV screens and bigger bigger uh, praise singing groups and fancier instruments and more uh, community projects. Let me tell you something. All your dreams and visions are worthless if they're not in line with the truth of God. Only the truth will make you free. Your preacher may have a big vision for your city, but if it's not God's vision, it's a lie and it's a deception. You're going to get caught in that vision and you're not going to be ready to meet Jesus when the trumpet sounds. I know what I'm talking about. I'm an old man. I'm 71 years old. I've been preaching for about 56 years. I've seen some things. I've heard some things. I can tell the difference between a real preacher and a phony preacher, and there's a whole bunch of phony preachers in this world today. When you hear a preacher can preach 30 minutes and, not, and never quote more than one or two scriptures, and he doesn't ever use it right anyway, he, he paraphrases it and uses it, and any man just tell you a bunch of stories, you better get away from that preacher. You need somebody to preach the word to you, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. And for what it's worth, the entire New Testament is centered on what happened in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Jesus came on the scene when John introduced Jesus Christ at the Jordan River. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. John the Baptist was talking about Jesus Christ was going to come, and he was going to baptize people with the Holy Ghost. John was baptizing them in water under repentance in his day. And when Jesus came along, he baptized his disciples. And then his disciples began to baptize everybody in his name. Everybody that they baptized. They baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. But Jesus said, I've got a baptism to be baptized with. And how I am straightened until it is accomplished. He's saying, I've got another baptism. It's just not just a water baptism, but it's a spirit baptism to go with it. That one Lord, one faith, and one 
baptism is a baptism of both water and spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus, if you're not born of the water and of the spirit, you're not born again and you're not going to see the kingdom of God. You have to be born of the water and you have to be born of the spirit. And there's a lot of ignorance and willful rejection of the truth of this matter. We've got a vast bulk of Christianity today that is an absolute total denial of the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I'm here to tell you the Pentecostal experience of the upper room in the early church, those 120 Jews that prayed for 10 days and upon whom the Holy Ghost fell and the tongues of fire fell, they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Later that day, after Peter preached to them, there were another 3,000 people that were filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. And through the coming week, there was another 5,000. 8,120 people at least in one week's time received that Pentecostal experience. And the apostles, every one of them, were tongue talkers, the Apostle Paul came along after them. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues and preached his testimony saying, I'm glad I speak with tongues more than you all. But we have a Christianity today that is virtually devoid of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. We've got Christian churches right now running in the hundreds and thousands of people. They don't preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They don't preach it as essential. They don't even, many of them don't even preach it as an option. They don't want to talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They want you to think you're born again without having received the Holy Ghost. But I'm here to tell you that when you get the Holy Ghost, you have the Spirit of Christ entering into you. And if you never receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you have never received the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ is more than an attitude. It's more than a behavior. It is the presence of God in you manifest by an overwhelming supernatural experience of praying and speaking in an unknown language. you got a bunch of people they call them cessationalists. They believe that all of those signs and wonders and miracles that we read about in the book of Acts, that they were only for an old, for an old time period and that we don't see those things anymore. But I'm here to tell you those Pentecostal experiences have not gone away. They have not ceased. Cessationism is a false doctrine. It is a heresy. And you need to be born of the Spirit today just like they did. Didn't you know the Bible said, Jesus said, many, many going to come to me in that day saying, uh, Lord, didn't we do many mighty works in your name? Didn't we cast out devils and heal the sick and raise the dead and do all these things? And he's going to say, depart from me. You workers of iniquity, I never knew you. We got churches nowadays that's full of good works. They're doing every kind of community project, but they don't have the Holy Ghost of God. You say, well, I don't think they need the Holy Ghost if they do good works. That's not what the Bible said. Paul said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You have to understand the Holy Ghost. What is, what is holy? Spirit, the Spirit of God. What is a ghost? It's the Spirit of one who's departed. What is the Holy Ghost? It's the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the departed one. He said, I, he that is with you, he told his apostles before he left, he said, he that is with you shall be in you. The comforter, he said, I'm going to send another comforter. The spirit that was in the body of Christ was poured out on the early church in the form of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we have never yet received the spirit of Christ. It's not just a behavior. It's not just a mindset. It is the virtual, true spirit of God. Now, it's more than virtual. It's the real spirit of God dwelling in you and me, and it is evidenced by our praying and speaking in an unknown language. Paul said, He that prayeth in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. He said, we, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue prayeth in a language that cannot be uttered, though, though there was much groanings. Your groanings, your prayer is never going to be as effective as it will be when you pray in the Spirit. And if you never pray in the Spirit, you never know the whole truth of the matter. And that's where I get back to my subject. The truth 
Only the truth will make you free. I'm telling you the baptism of the Holy Ghost will take you into a dimension with God that you will never get into without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Don't settle for a church that doesn't want the Pentecostal experience. Don't settle for a church that won't preach the truth of God. It has to do with every aspect of the gospel. It has everything to do with holy living, godly living. We've got to adopt New Testament morals. We've got to adopt New Testament lifestyles, New Testament modesty, New Testament uh, selflessness. We've got to dispense with our carnality and worldliness that we have. We've got with the worldliest, carnal, most carnally minded professing Christians that ever have been in the history of the world. We've got people who are uh, esteemed as great spiritual leaders, and yet their lifestyles prove and demonstrate that they are as carnal and worldly as the unregenerate crowd out there that they claim to be saving. Let me tell you something. God will make a change on you. You will change your way of living. You'll change your way of talking. You'll change your way of dressing. You'll change your morals and your attitudes and your character, all your standards will change when you come into that Pentecostal experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. You'll hear the word. Read the epistles, the New Testament epistles. Paul dealt with every kind of behavior in the early church. We don't even preach the biggest part of those in so many of our churches today. We don't have preachers telling us the things that the apostle Paul preached. They don't preach what Peter preached in his epistles. They don't preach what Jude preached in the book of Jude. They skip over all that stuff. They don't do the reproof and the rebuke and the exhortation that Paul said is that furnishes us unto good works. They Simply glide over those things, ignore them, and pretend they're not there. But let me tell you something. Only the truth can make you free. You can only be changed by a comprehensive truth into the image of Christ. And without a comprehensive, open-hearted acceptance of all the great truths of God, can you ever come to be like the Spirit of Christ? I love to, I love to speak about the Spirit of Christ in these terms. If our lives don't manifest a comprehensive representation of everything that Jesus was, then we're, we're, only, we're only partially there. You know, John said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. You can preach that. And they'll and you, but you can reduce that down in a minimalistic say. So if you love God, and, and you know Jesus was asked one day, "What's what's the summary basically of all the law and the prophets?" He said, "Love the Lord God with all your heart and soul and mind, and your neighbor as yourself." And that's a great sum, summation, and it is a true summation because Jesus said it, and it's a great principle and precept of truth that everybody needs to know and understand. But don't ever think that that's the whole gospel. Don't tell me that just by loving somebody you've done everything you need to do to be saved. You're not going to be saved just because you love somebody. You've got to be born again. You've got to change your way. You've got to repent of your wickedness, and it means you've got to quit doing it. We've got sinful people out there that loves a lot of people, but they're not going to be saved because loving others is not going to save you. That's not what saves you. Repentance and being born again of the water and the Spirit is, is it's not just critical. It's essential. That, that's, that's the one thing that you, you, you'll get in a contest with nearly all of Christianity is more, is what is essential to salvation. The vast majority of professing Christians today will not tell you that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is essential. And I'm here to tell you by the word of the Lord, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is absolutely essential to your salvation. And if you don't get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're not going to be saved. Paul said, Romans 8 and 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. I'm talking about only truth will make you free. If you don't embrace all these truths, you're not free. If you don't get a hold of these truths, you're not free yet. It applies to the church. It applies to the gospel. It applies to the nation of Israel. When I go to Israel, and I've been there many times, I always, every time I go, I go to the Wailing Wall and pray, and I always am a little bit amazed and impressed to see how many Jews come every day and every night to pray at the Wailing Wall. And I watch them there with their prayer books, with their prayer shawls, with their little uh, hats and all of their religious paraphernalia. And I, I think to myself, Jesus said, 
I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Guys, only truth is going to make you free. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. If you don't go by Jesus Christ, if you don't embrace the incarnation of God in Christ, if you don't embrace, embrace the doctrine of Christ, if you don't believe that Jesus is God's only begotten Son, if you don't believe that God was in Christ reconciling the world himself, you don't know the Father. And all those Jews, for all their praying, they can quote every book in the Talmud and the Torah. But if they don't embrace Jesus Christ, no man comes to the Father except through Christ. And that's, that's part of this statement. Only truth can make you free. If you deny the truth, and there's a great deal of rejection of Christ in Israel today, and I'm, I'm always mindful that God said to Abraham, I'll bless those that bless you, and I'll curse them that curse you. I, I want to be always consistent to bless Israel, and I want to always be faithful never to curse Israel. But I'm not going to fail to preach the gospel because I'm, my job to Israel today is the very same as the apostles' job was to Israel. Peter and all the apostles preached Acts 2 message. They all preached repentance. They all preached baptism in Jesus' name. They all preached the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they all practiced it. And all those, everybody in the upper room, in that hundred, they, those 120 in the room, they were all Jews. And for the most part, everybody they preached to in the early church New Testament was to Jews. It was the apostle Paul that went and took the gospel to the Gentiles of his day. But the rest of the Jews, and so why would I preach a different message to the Jews today than Peter and Paul preach? I'm going to tell every Jew and every Gentile on earth you, what you have to do to be saved. The gospel does not change. It has not changed. 2,000 years since the gospel came to this world, but it has never changed, and we must not change it because only truth can make you free. I'm here to tell you, Jew or Gentile, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, I don't care who you are and where you came from. The only way to know God is by this Bible and by the man Jesus Christ who is the incarnation of this word. No part is as big as the whole. Tell, tell yourself, no part is as big as the whole. That's why the Bible said, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't know the truth, you can't rightly divide it. I mean, if you've read it one time, that's good. But you've read it twice, you realize you missed a lot. You read it a third time. I've read this thing dozens, probably scores of times in my lifetime. A lot, of, a lot of the verses in this Bible, I've read thousands and thousands of times in my lifetime. And every time I open this book, I see something fresh and new, often things that I've never seen before. That is, the, that is what I was talking about when I say that only truth will make you free. As I continue to grow in revelation, as I continue to see greater and greater truths as I live, each day I maintain that status of my freedom as a free man in God. And the minute I begin to reject truth, you got to hear me, the day you begin to reject truth is the day you begin to go backwards and don't think you can't be a backslider because God God re pronounced rebukes on Israel in the day he called them a backsliding heifer because when the prophets preached to them they pulled back against them they would not obey the preaching of the gospel and of the Old Testament message they wouldn't repent of their sins they were like a backslider they wanted to go the other way they didn't want to go the way God wanted them to go and we got people that's been in church and suddenly they decided they don't want all this stuff they've heard they don't want all this doctrine they don't want all these standards they don't want all this you can't do this you can't do that they want to be saved on their own terms and friend I'm telling you something it's never going to happen you're never going to be saved <laughs> uh, somebody said that Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way, is one song that's never going to be sung in heaven. Nobody in heaven's going to be singing, I Did It My Way. The only ones in heaven's going to be the ones that did it God's way because only the truth will make you free. You need all the gospel truth. Don't denounce or renounce any, not even one jot or tittle of the truth. Embrace every bit of it. You say, well, there's too much of it. Well, that's what you're supposed to study for. You say, well, I don't have time for all that. No, but you've got time to watch YouTube and television and stupid stuff and watch, go to ball games and, and have cookouts and go to the lake and ride on your boats or go in your RV campers on trips or take vacations and go here and yonder, but you don't have time to read your Bible and know God. 
You better get real. You better realize that there's nothing in this world as good as your eternal salvation. And if you'll give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, Matthew 6, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. If you'll put God first and seek his truth and seek his kingdom with everything in you, you'll never lack for what you need. God will meet your need. But if you put yourself and your needs and your wants ahead of the will of God, you're never going to know the freedom that you think you have because it's a false hope and it's a delusion. I beg you today, if you don't have that kind of an experience with God, if you don't have an upper room experience, if, you don't, if you've never had that experience of praying in the Spirit in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives you that utterance, you don't know what you're missing. You, you don't, don't tell me it's not real. I've been preaching and practicing this the biggest part of my life. You'll never talk me out of this baptism of the Holy Ghost stuff because it's real, it's real. Oh, taste and see. Taste it and see it. Get in this Pentecostal way and find out. It's real. It's real. Get into this Pentecostal church and find out. It's not what you were told. Some people told you it was bad. Some people told you it's not real. Some people told you it was heresy. Some people told you they're full of devils down there. But I'm going to tell you, if you speak evil of the Holy Ghost, you better watch your tongue. This Holy Ghost Pentecostal Acts 2 experience is just as real today as it was back in those days. The Spirit in you, Christ in you, is the hope of glory. What does that mean? That means if you don't get the Spirit of Christ, if you don't get the Holy Ghost, you don't have the hope of glory. Christ in you, the Holy Ghost in you, is the hope of glory. Only the truth can make you free. All right, I'm going to cut it short. I've said what I think I need to say to that. May God save us all. Find a Pentecostal church somewhere. Repent of your sins. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Pray and seek and worship the Lord until you find yourself in that upper room experience as the Spirit of God falls on you and you begin to pray in the Spirit and speak in the Spirit in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives you the utterance. And then write and tell me how good it is because I know you will. Because it's real, friend. May God bless you. Thank you for listening to me tonight. That's my message. Thank you for listening. If you haven't got any of my books, let me just tell you quickly about this book, The Greatest Doctrines of the Bible. This talks about the new birth. 420 pages, 432 pages of The Greatest Doctrines of the Bible. This is about the oneness of God and the new birth. It's going to explain to you all about what I've been talking to you about. You're going to realize when you study the doctrines of this Bible, you're going to realize they are not optional. They are essential. They're not here for our entertainment. They're not here as take it or leave it. These are essential doctrines of the Bible. I urge you to get this book. You can go to Amazon right now and get it. It's called The Greatest Doctrines of the Bible by Ken Raggio. Just search on Books by Ken Radjo on Amazon. You see nine books. One of the other books is called Praying on Purpose, Praying for Results, How Men Pray with, Prevail with God. There's a chapter on here, in here about praying in the Spirit. That, book, that chapter will help you. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it'll kind of give you some instructions on how to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You need all these books. These uh, two books here, Volume 1 and 2, My Daily Bible Companion. This is the Old Testament. There's... Uh, Thousands of many lessons, 100-word lessons. I go through the entire Bible, chapter by chapter. Every chapter of the Bible, there's lessons from that chapter. I explain a lot of the hard sayings, help you to understand what you're reading. Keep it by your favorite sitting chair or your bed at night. When you're reading the Bible, open this book up and read some lessons along with it. You're going to find it. It's a great, great inspiration. There's a lot of books on prayer, a lot of, a lot of lessons I should say on prayer, a lot of lessons on the new birth, a lot of good doctrinal lessons in this book. And as far as prophecy, check out this book, The Daniel Prophecies, God's Plan for the Last Day, 726 pages, 175 photographs, footnotes all the way through. This is one of the most uh, revolutionary books you're ever going to find 
on the subject of Bible prophecies for the last days. And folks, I'll tell you one more time. We're in the last days. We're looking right in the smack dab face of the coming mark of the beast, the great tribulation, the sixth trumpet war, the 144,000 Jews being sealed, the two witnesses rising up, the man of sin standing in the temple, the desolation of Jerusalem, and just the battle of Armageddon, the resurrection of the church, and the rapture of the church, and the uh, battle of Armageddon, and a thousand years with Christ. I mean, guys, we're at the end. We're at the end. You need the gospel. You need every truth you can get your mind around. The whole truth, only truth, is going to make you free. Go to Amazon, check out these books. If you'd like to get all nine of these books at a big discount, uh, check out the link below aisle for all nine books. Uh, you can pay for it through PayPal. Uh, it's $125 only for those who have an American address. Also, if you can make a donation to help me out with this ministry, I'd greatly appreciate it. There's links below that shows you how you can make a donation. Also, please help me to spread this around. If you're watching me on Facebook, please click like on this and make some comments on it. Or if you're on YouTube uh, or Rumble or BitChute, please subscribe to my video channels. Help me to reach you through that. Click the notification bell. Also, follow me on all my social networks, Facebook, MeWe, Gab, Truth Social, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, all the places you can find me. And we'll try to get the gospel to you. Also, go to my website at KenRaggio.com and visit that. There's thousands and thousands of pages of great apostolic Pentecostal teachings and prophecy teachings are on that website. You can also sign up there for my daily Bible study by mail. You can get an email once a day, four mini lessons in each email every day, and I'd love to have you on my mailing list. Please go there and join me. Meanwhile, take care. Go to church this Sunday, and I'll see you next time. God bless you. Good night.